For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our ancient history fan community, visit patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Welcome to Trowelocity, a video series in which we talk with archaeologists and ancient historians about their work. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Mesoamerican scholar and art historian Tatiana Valdez Bubnova. She was in the news recently after having uh, said to have deciphered glyphs appearing at the site of Teotihuacan, a place where writing has believed to be for a long time absent. Uh, we're going to ask her all about it, but before we do, please show your support for this series by pressing the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Okay, let's talk ancient Mesoamerica. <laughs> The person we are talking with today is a full-time research professor at El Calejo de Morelos, just south of Mexico City. She has a Mexican father and a Russian mother, in case you couldn't tell by her name, and although she has spent most of her life in Mexico, she studied in Russia and received her master's degree in design and art criticism at Moscow State University. She also got a master's degree and a doctorate in Mesoamerican studies from UNAM in Mexico City and there was awarded two Alfonso Caso medals, one for her doctoral thesis on Teotihuacan. She has done further research at the University of Montreal and has also helped to develop a database of Mesoamerican oral tradition narratives. She is an expert on Mesoamerican art and imagery, codices, Nahua hieroglyphs, and on Teotihuacan. So please welcome with me, Dr. Tatiana Valdez. Thank you for being with us, Tatiana. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Miano, for inviting me to this thing. So let me ask you right off the bat. Thank you. Yes. What made you want to be an art historian? Well, um, all my life, I like arts and drawings so i first started after the high school studies and all that kind of studies to um, make a professional studies in the art school from mexico and then i got um, an opportunity to finish my studies in moscow so um, I already knew Russian language and I wanted to travel. So I went to study in art school in, in Moscow where I got a master degree also. And my um, basic studies are in arts in Russia. But uh, with the bachelor's uh, degree, you get also an art criticism degree in the Russian system. So in, in, in with the, the studies, that, that with the theoretical studies that you get in the art school, you are uh, able to receive that, that degree, okay? I so mm -hmm. then I went back to Mexico after my studies and uh, after working in the art, to, in the cinema industry mostly, uh, in the art uh, department. I wanted to continue my, continue my studies, uh, my post uh, bachelor studies, my upper higher studies. Uh -huh. Then I had the opportunity once again to, to continue the, the specific studies in. I was thinking that maybe it will be good to study in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico in the arts department, but then I realized that there is also a specialized uh, degree that you can get in Mesoamerican studies. So instead of uh, having my studies in arts, I studied a general Mesoamerican pano panorama, panorama and, yeah. mm -hmm, mm, in the Mesoamerican studies. That's where I realized that um, there is a 
probable there was a probable misconception about the difference from uh, the Mesoamerican world uh, that uh, is divided in the Maya literate world and the illiterate world from the Central and Northern Mesoamerica. I thought that that, that is a very interesting topic to study. So that's the... Before idea. you get into that, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't help but hear you say that uh, this is completely off topic, but you said that you were working for the cinema? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious about what you did with that? Like, okay. were you making uh, graphics or art? Yes, or? I made graphics. I made painting and all, all kinds of graphics together. For movies, uh, like posters yes, that, thing? Oh, OK. Yes, that's right. <laughs> this is a very interesting. That's, that was my first job when I went okay. to Mexico. And uh, the time passed, and I tried to um, enter to the postgraduate studies. Uh -huh. That mm -hmm. That's my. <laughs> and, and I also wanted to ask you a little bit about um, uh, about the the mer the mixing of Mexican and Russian culture yes. and how yes. different they must be. What is that like uh, being in both worlds? Well, I, uh, that's the case of many mixed people. In my case, I think that it is uh, it was a little bit difficult to. Um, uh, get a base to uh, understand the, myself mm -hmm. as a mixed cultural pre, uh, person. So the problems with identity, I think not the problems, but the conception of my own identity, that's what made me study arts and went to Russia and went back to Mexico and studied Mesoamerican studies. So that's very personal, I think. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. I just, yeah, I was curious about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, now, so you had mentioned just before I, I went off on those other topics, um, about the difference between two types of um, of art, right? You said there was kind of a dividing line between uh, art from this area and art from that area. Could you expound on that a little bit? Well, um, the Mayan culture in the Mesoamerican studies uh, context are were were very well developed since the nineteenth century. You can say so for the North, mid, uh, Middle Mesoamerica and North Mesoamerica um, cultures, because there were there was a, a lot of investment of res on research on the Mayan area from uh, European uh, um, archaeological research and even North American but just in the Mayan area. So uh, there are also different uh, cultural situations in the South Mesoamerica and the, uh, Central Northern Mesoamerica because you have a homo homogenized uh, um, yes. homogeneous, yeah. homogeneous linguistical area, the Mayan area. Instead of that, the central and uh, North Mesoamerica, you have a lot of cultural mix that involves uh, different languages, with different fa language families, yes? Mm -hmm. So you have a very, in that sense, homogeneous uh, kind of uh, uh, archaeological findings in the Maya Maya area. If you contrast, if you can, if you see it as a contrast with the with the with the, with the other area that, that I mentioned, so um, you have also a quite big area that uh, um, as cultural homogeneous, uh, and the findings there uh, are. Um, um, characterized by a lot of 
descriptions like with hieroglyphics that are mixed with uh, imagery. Uh, as research, as archaeological research in the southern area realized that there was really a, a system of writing in the southern area. And the idea of the scholars uh, as developing in time uh, was in one point contrasting the literate Mayan area and the non-literate uh, other North Mesoamerican cultures, but you have to uh, consider that the research was uh, very focalized and developed in the Mayan area by contrast with the central and northern Mexican area, and also the cultural uh, view of the Mayan area uh, was homogeneous by contrast with lots of cultures in the, in the north and, so, and central area that they have something quite like Mayan hieroglyph by structure, but you cannot decipher because there were lots of uh, um, migrations up along the history of that cultural area. Uh -huh. So if, so if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that uh, everybody, uh, the, all the archaeologists and historians were kind of treating everything as if it were the same, all the glyphs and all the art, but actually, especially on the outskirts, there were um, different ways of doing things. There, there, there are, there are di uh, divergences from this one Mayan way of, uh, of doing it. Does that make, is that what you're trying to say? Um, that there's I'm more trying diversity. To say that uh, they have scholars had a lot of lot of success deciphering in time Mayan hieroglyphs, but they didn't have the, the same success uh, in in ah, treating okay. the, the 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 other scripts. So so that uh, these these other areas were neglected. They they didn't give them enough attention, and and you wanted to give them more attention. That's right. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, have you always been interested in ancient uh, studies or um, like how, you just went into Mesoamerican studies because uh, that was just the thing to do or did you, had you actually love that period of time? I love that period of time definitely because that was more, personally more, more attractive than the other options that the university gave that are um, uh, um, Colonial art studies and modern art studies. That, that, that's personal pre preference. Uh -huh. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, if you were to explain to the audience like what your uh, field of research is all about, what you specialize in, uh, mm -hmm. what, what you get called in for when people need help, uh, what do you specifically uh, work on? Yes, uh, I have worked on Mesoamerican art in general. Teotihuacan hieroglyphs. Inter uh, interpretation of the art, like the meaning of the art? Yes, especially interpretations and from a semiotical point of view, mainly. Uh -huh. uh, I have worked on topics related to general semiotics and rhetoric of the visual, the visual image. And in addition, Teotihuacan art as an anti. anti antecedente and as an um, antecedent. Oh, antecedent? Uh, yeah, things that came before? Yes, that's right. To the Mesoamerican tradi uh, tradition uh, codex. Yes, the, the books from the Mesoamerican right. cultures. Uh -huh. And also I worked on, tra uh, on translating Ma uh, uh, Nahuatl hieroglyphs, but from the 16th century. Okay. How, um, how, how different are the codices and the, the contents of the codices and the art different from the art from hundreds of years before? Have there been a lot of changes? Yes, uh, in archaeological uh, remains, we don't have uh, any codices, any books from Teotihuacan. That's not the case from the Mayan area. 
there are remains from codices from the Mayan area with writing, but from Teotihuacan, uh, anything. And you have to consider that the Mayan area is it's a whole territorial territorial area. But in Teotihuacan, we only have one city as a as a cultural focus. So you can compare in the same level and many cities in the Mayan area and one single city in the same period at the, in, at the Teotihuacan Plateau, yes. So there are different things. But anyway, in uh, uh, archaeological remains, we don't have Teotihuacan books, but we have some kind of glyphs in other uh, media, okay? visual medias like uh, mural painting, like uh, pottery and uh, sculpture mostly. So uh, we understand that maybe that kind of media or, su or support for the visual arts are not the media to transmit uh, writing. But uh, in some exceptions, the Teotihuacanos have, have uh, written something there, yes? So that's the situation and uh, that's how I see it. And that's how I... Yeah. So, so what, what, what is the difference, uh, would you say, between um, hieroglyphs and art? Are, are they completely two different things or is there a little bit of overlap? Uh, well, it's a little bit overlap uh, in the way that uh, many of the remains of writing in Mesoamerica are mixed compositions where uh, visual, visual imagery is completed in some way or Yes, completed. It's it's, it's okay mm, with uh, hieroglyphical writing. Okay, so we have examples, very very ancient examples, even in the Mayan area, that show this kind of uh, composition in pre-classic morals, as in San Bartolo, Guatemala, uh, where you can find this uh, this way to express uh, meaning. Uh -huh. And uh, you can see that uh, in big, uh, big cultures from the pre-classic and even from classic Mesoamerica, you have the same situation. Maybe there were codices with this kind of books, but uh, you have only codices from later periods remaining in the archeological uh, data data, but uh, some writing remained in the in, 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 in architecture, for, for example, yes. And that's how you can compare what happened in the pre-classic and what happened in the classic period and the, in the post-classic. And you can realize that there is a system that have, have some uh, um, structures in common in the whole macro, macro cultural area of Mesoamerica. Uh -huh. And by comparative uh, way of uh, um, research, you can find that uh, you can propose, but maybe not in any time, uh, demonstrate that something is writing. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. That's the idea. Uh -huh. So um, I probably sh maybe should have asked this earlier, but um, when people visit Mexico, they're often like, well, you got to go to Teotihuacan. That's one of the places that you're supposed to go to visit. Um, but they get confused between Teotihuacan and the Maya. And um, could you tell us a little bit about what, wh why, how it's different from the Maya and why it's important in the history of Mexico? Yes, of course. Uh, we have a, col a cultural er me er macro area that is called Meso Mesoamerica, yes. And Mesoamerica is composed by many uh, 
not not many big cultural areas that are defined by many cultural um, features yes the Ma the the mayan cultural area is uh, for example characterized because they have a land uh, they be, they all belong all the mayan cultures that live in that uh, area belong to a single family of languages yes that's not what is happening necessarily in other cultural areas from mesoamerica you have the north northern uh, sub area from mesoamerica that, that that is composed by many ethnical groups that speaks different languages and that's what you can find in other cultural areas so you can at first time see that the mayan area is different in that in that sense yes you have cultures that are related for many for many many years and hundreds of years by a single history and in uh, general uh, explanation uh, because they share uh, commerce because they share languages that can make them understand each other yes by contrast with other areas that, that you have uh, different uh, cultural groups that have other dynamics in the in the, in the commerce or or other cultural features yes uh -huh. so uh, in teotihuacan we we don't for example we don't know teotihuacan belongs to the central mesoamerican cultural area the one of the most uh, um, um, descriptive characteristic of that cultural area is that it's a very um not homogeneous because there were a lot of migrations along all the Mesoamerican history time. So, uh, but for example, of that situation, we got, we have that, uh, we don't even know, we are not sure what language was the main language that was spoken in Teotihuacan. Yes, we know that some part from the classical Mayan world, they speak Cho, Mayan Chol or Yucateco Mayan or another mm -hmm. type of Maya, Mayan language. But in Teotihuacan, we know that there were uh, many ethnical group, groups living together, yes. Oh, I, I always thought it was uh, uh, like an early Nahuatl or something, but no, it's not. No, not necessarily. No, okay. there are different points of view about if, Ma, if Nahuatl language could be in the early classical period uh, present in that, uh, in that region. Okay, so there are different uh, explanations about the cultural movement of people that got uh, that brought with them the Nahuatl language. Yes, I see. Uh -huh. so, and and is it true that that Teotihuacan is the greatest of all Mesoamerican cities, the biggest, the greatest, that no other city compares to it uh, from ancient Mesoamerica? Well. Uh, Teotihuacan was a highly developed, uh, has a highly developed urbanism for that moment. So it's very, uh, there is a very big contrast be between other cities that were developed at that, the time that Teotihuacan was uh, living. Yes, the Teotihuacan was, culture was uh, functional. And so, yes, Teotihuacan was the biggest city of its time in Mesoamerica and in many parts of the world, and was concentrating about uh, um, some, some archaeologists think that in, in some point about 20, 100,000 people living in it, and that people was where it was mixed 
from many ethnical groups and uh, between the ethnical groups there are different theories of which ones must be liberating uh -huh, uh, the Teotihuacan economics and politics etc. Uh -huh. So yes. I think um, what we're mostly interested in is um, what your contribution was to our understanding of Teotihuacan and what were you able to figure out that others have not? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I think there is a contribution about the hieroglyphs uh, in Teotihuacan in the sense that uh, the, the discoveries and the development of the reading of Mayan hieroglyphs was depending, depends on um, the grouping of lots of uh, archaeological data about that system of writing along all the time that Mayan archaeology was developing in China. So you have a very large corpus studied since the late 19th century. And there were changes about the way that archaeologists uh, make an interpretation of that materials. Okay, so uh, the state of art in Teotihuacan was very different because we didn't have such an interest in making a systematic. Uh, um, corpus that may be able to make a research about Teotihuacan writing. So uh, in just one city, you can uh, you have you have a lot of uh, work to do about that problem. Uh -huh. So I think my contribution is in that sense. And uh, the first time that I wanted to make is um, a general corpus of all Publish the material, archaeological materials that has, has to do with uh, higher problems or similar things. Uh -huh. this so is, no one had put this information together before, right? No, in that sense, no. We, we have a, a very important uh, work that made uh, James Langley in the late 80s, 1986, was published in the be a British archaeological report uh, um, that uh, presented a decontextualized corpus of uh, kinds of sign of graphic signs in Teotihuacan, but that it's very useful, but, but very different for, from what I made because my corpus is not decontextualized, okay? So you have items, you don't have uh, abstract signs that may, you may find in many contexts, like, like James Langley's work. In my work, you can see this item, this hieroglyph belongs to a vase that not, has not only, for example, an hieroglyph, but also a, big, um, a, um, a scene that integrates that hieroglyph wow. that can bring also information from what that hieroglyph is about. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's not just what the glyph looks like, it's where it appears, right? That's, that's right, yes. That's Which it. could help uh -huh. figure out what, what the meaning is. Yes, I can help because that, uh, uh, okay, that's one way, one um, structural way to approach to the meaning of a uh, contextual meaning of a hierarchy. You are not reading, it, but you are interpreting what can be the, spec the spectrum of meaning. Uh -huh. mm. uh -huh. uh, sort of a so, range, a range of possible. Range of, a range of yeah. possible meaning. That's yeah. right. Have you been able to figure out what any of the glyphs mean? Or, I mean, have you been able to narrow down the range at all to figure out what, what glyphs mean? Well, I maintain in that work that we still have a lot of work to do. 
because uh, um, I made a work that uh, it's based on the context in many levels. One of the level is the artifact. Another level is the uh, architectural element or compound where the artifact was found when you have information about that. So uh, that point of view has its limits because you have a lot of information that you <laughs> still have to uh, rethink about how to uh, make uh, meaningful groups of it, yes? Because the limits of the contextualization in architectonical sense is very different, different than if you make a corpus based on, for example, the kind of scenes where the hieroglyphs uh, belong. Yes. Uh -huh. So Good. that's. I I can I can tell you that this work is it's the first step to make other corpuses that can bring some structural light on the meaning of the of the hieroglyphs in this in this uh, very confusing um, region to make a pro proposals of translations of hieroglyphs. Because uh, I don't make, as I told you, any translation because I think that there is a, still a lot of work to do with the corpus. But I'm not telling with that that you can't make proposal proposals of reading, a heuristic proposal. Oh, I think that this means this because, and I uh, propose some situation when it makes sense. But uh you have that it's not the end of the process you still have a corpus where you can try to defend and to demonstrate that it works in other examples and that's the problem I see. one of the main problems uh, how yes. many how many different glyphs have been discovered there well the corpus is about uh, about 200 200 of hieroglyphs of of uh, probable hieroglyphs because you can't affirm uh, solidly uh, that you got a hieroglyph before you have demonstrated it. Mm -hmm. And to demonstrate it, you may have to make a comparative work very uh, extended with the corpus that you have. Yes, mm -hmm. and that work is not done at all in the Otihuacan. Uh -huh. Because sometimes you, you look at it, it, it could just be an image, it could just be a picture, right? It doesn't have to be a glyph necessarily, That's right. right? Necessarily, or other kind of symbol. Uh -huh. Yes, not necessarily a uh, figurative image, but maybe a symbol like the ones that we used in our military forces, uh, for example, on another kind of graphic symbol that we use. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. But uh, mm, so when the when the when the news when the news came out and they're like, oh, she's deciphered uh no, I'm not. At all. I'm not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no. They're making more sorry. out of it than what it <laughs> but you have you have uh, brought us to the next level, right? Yes, the that's next right. step towards deciphering. Yes. And uh, you can correct this corpus because it's the first step. And uh we, we, I also show that uh, there is a lot of uh, things that may, maybe we shall, shall reconsider in the way that we are classifying the corpus and the archaeological data. In, for example, and I want to, to, to tell you this, that we have a lot of uh, pottery examples that are um, classified uh, in order to make uh, inferences of a da da datation or of uh, other archaeological contexts. But 
when you see some pictures of the other, that of that archaeological remains you don't see others and in others in the others you have the hieroglyphs for instance and uh, that means that we have to do a lot of work inside the uh, reservoirs of uh, for example uh, pottery in all its different uh, manifestations uh, uh, in search of the hieroglyphs that uh, you don't have uh, registered in the publications or they are even still there and nobody saw that uh, nobody was interested in that mm -hmm. How many more glyphs do you think there are to find? Not the, uh, I think that we have find the, the basic corpus of glyphs, like uh, with the James Langley work in 1986. But uh, um, there are, they may be more, but uh, uh, that uh, it's an arrow pointing to the, the the writing system that it's coherent with the writing systems of all mesoamerica that, that's I what i sustain yes that are lo, logo syllabic uh, writing systems that is coherent with the um cantidad with the amount of types of glyphs that langley Found found in the eighties, in the nineteen eighties. Yes. Okay. So, so mm -hmm. has your has we your still work... have problems. We still have oh, problems yeah. that we what we have in Teotihuacan, uh, contrasting with the Mayan area, is that all the hieroglyphs that Langley sees in his uh, in his work, in his published work, is uh, considered. Um, it's, um, at, at the same time, you don't have time timing contrasts. They are all synchronic. Oh, okay? I see. From a sy synchronic point of view. He's, so, he's assuming they come from the same time, even though they come from right. different times. I see. He's not assuming that. He's just oh. making that kind of work. He oh. was an archaeologist and he knew that there may belong to different periods, but that's not in his work. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, so uh, how, I mean, uh, Langley's work compared to your work, you've added more to it and you've given it more context. Is that kind of- Yes, that's doing? right. That's the idea. Uh -huh. can, can you give us an example of an interesting, uh, an interesting glyph um, whose meaning um, we're closer to understanding? Well, that's uh, from the structural point of view, you have uh, some relations that are constant between images in Mesoamerica and uh, hieroglyphs. So there are many glyphs in Teotihuacan that uh, are painted or engraved by side of, uh, un un of uh, human figures. So we think that all the glyphs that are represented close to human figures may represent their um, own names of the person or titles of the person who is represented with like uh, with uh, um, visual images. Okay, uh, that's one example. Uh, for other example, and in my thesis, I propose many of the other. Uh, there are place names that's not only my idea but uh, it, it's uh, um, coherent with many many other researchers and um, um, I propose also what what was the use of uh, using hieroglyphs in some contexts uh, um, Okay, some of my proposals are also that some deities are named by her hieroglyphs in the Teotihuacan context. Uh, like deities we already know about? Well, 
maybe we can't translate it because uh, what have uh, what I have already said, but uh, um, they, they look like do they look like deities that we know? No, not at all. Oh. They interesting. Uh, it may be interesting for some of the uh, people who are listening to this interview. Uh, if you have a scene where some priests are um, making uh, cult uh, actions in front of a uh, hieroglyph, you may assume or propose that that's the name of something that must be um the god that they're making the offering to yes that's right and that's the the case in teotihuacan you have instead of the figure figure that represents a, a god or something godlike uh -huh, mm -hmm. a hieroglyph with a name okay. and a so cal calendrical name uh -huh. I see. So we, we say, oh, this is probably a God's name, but we don't know anything about what the God is like, or do we? That's right. That's okay. right. Yes. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there. So so you think that more more uh, information will be coming uh, from this work, probably uh, as we get. I closer. hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I know that there is a lot of work to do, and I hope that someone will use this material to or these ideas because mm -hmm. there are also ideas here to um, contrast with other materials and uh, may find that uh, they are working or they are, you have to to throw that idea away <laughs> okay can, uh, can you can you give us an example of an idea that you put forth in the in the book that uh, that needs to be investigated Yes, in the, um, for example, in the little clay figures that, that were used in Teotihuacan context, in many Teotihuacan contexts, you have different uh, um, positions on the body of the person who is represented, where you may find what I think what may be hieroglyphs. So when you find that Teotihuacan, it's a city where, where, where art uh, doesn't uh, look for individual features, I say that, uh, wait a second, maybe we are not understanding the signs on the body or in the um, wardrobe of the figures that are being represented. So I think there's still a lot of research to be done in that way. And so the, the, the writing in clay figures. So a clay figure that has writing on it, you're saying that that writing may individualize the figure, make it maybe, maybe. unique to a person or like in other Mesoamerican cultures has uh, been uh, witnessed. Oh, I see. Okay, that's yeah, that's very interesting. Maybe so. It's a maybe, maybe that. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yes, yeah. all this maybe. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. Well, these are very interesting ideas. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, so, what are you working on right now? Well, uh, because of the place where I work right now, the institution where I work right now, I'm working on. Uh, this Mesoamerican imagery from Nahuatl tradition, but uh, on examples of the 16th century. So I work mostly right now on in a representation of space in kinds of uh, maps. Uh, I'm not, well, in kinds of maps in, in, from the 16th century, made from Indian people uh, from the Morelos area that was a now is a Nahuatl area. Ah. So we have there also top toponyms and uh, labels that uh, give you the information about who that person was, if someone is represented, the, the things that are similar, but very different in time from what I made from Teotihuacan. Okay. Uh, uh, where could people go to find out more information about your corpus of, of glyphs? Is there anywhere that any website or, or somewhere they could go to find out more information about it? 
sorry. Uh, you can find me if you have a, um, particular questions in my Facebook. Uh, my name is Tatiana Valdez Bugnova. Valdez is with Z. And uh, then I can answer questions to you. But also, uh, this uh, was. Well, Firstly, was my PhD thesis. It's now published in the website of the Colegio de Morelos. You can find the book. It's free. You can download, oh, download okay. it and read it. Uh, it's how, how many pages is that? <laughs> about 800. 800 pages, okay. About that, yes. But uh, you don't have to read it like a novel. You, there if are you many things appendixes. Up in it, yeah. If you are interested in the hieroglyphs that were found and published from one architectural uh, compound in Teotihuacan, you can read only that part. That's how it's organized. Uh -huh. Excellent. All right. Okay. Well, I think yeah, that's a valuable contribution to, to scholarship for sure. Um, and, and I want to thank you for uh, coming on uh, the show today and talking with me and telling me all about it because uh, I think it's very interesting. I love work on deciphering hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs from all over the world. And this is another step towards uh, understanding these glyphs. So I think that's fantastic. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you. And we're going to keep an eye on you and your work and uh, see what else uh, comes out. So, uh, but thank you uh, for appearing with us and uh, wish you the best on your, your future work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oriano. Thank you. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.